thank you anyway. Um, thanks also for the invitation to this uh, wonderful forum. Uh, we're very honored to be here. I say we because, um, as already was said, um, I'm, I'm here alone, but Kerstin uh, somehow in his spirits is also there, and an entire office that is in uh, Brussels. We are based in Brussels. And uh, today I wanted to just show you, since, uh, well, this is the first time I'm in Ukraine, and um, so we, we cannot really relate to, to the country. But I guess with a certain uh, European practice as we're having it from Brussels, uh, we wanted to show you projects to, um, to somehow share ideas on, on how, how architecture can be made, uh, as been said, in a certain way with a simple set of tools and means and still be very uh, powerful as a, as a subject to, to think, to discuss, to communicate and uh, to make community. Uh, first, just two images of a slight introduction to our work. This is a uh, old work. I mean, old is from 2005, a competition uh, for a border crossing, pedestrian border crossing between the United States and Mexico. And uh, this is a design we made and uh, we won the competition in 2005. Uh, it has never been built, but the ideas are very simple, you could say. Uh, the, the, you, the, there's, a, there's a big fence between the two countries in the desert, and you can make maybe the, the, the no man's land, the, the, the kind of um, in-between land, uh, look like the promised land. So something between Mexico and the U USA becomes an oasis an oasis with a, a grid of palm trees that gives you shade uh, while waiting uh, in one or for to enter one or the other country. It's sort of a, a critique, but at the same time, it's also a very, um, let's say, human and, and very pragmatic approach to, to that kind of situation. A very different project, this is uh, more recent, but uh, it's a house in Spain we made. Uh, it's totally self-sufficient house in the, in the middle of nature near uh, Barcelona. And we were asked to, to, to think of a house without any further limits in, in let's say, a program. We were given carte blanche, as they call it, uh, to think of what is a house in this landscape and how can you so-called survive and, and and live there uh, during holidays. Um, and you can see these are very basic architectural uh, geometries. One was a rectangle, uh, a wall surrounding palm trees. The other one, the house, is a, is a, is a pure circle that again surrounds a piece of uh, wilderness looking out to the wilderness. And I guess our architecture you can describe as trying to look for this simple form, simple means, what can you say, and at the same time, what does it do to its immediate context? This is an exhibition we made, and you can see a, a bit of uh, models mixed with art pieces, mixed with, um, with, with other models, with paintings even. It was in a museum in Brussels. And it's one of the rooms, so there were many rooms, and this was one of them. But I, I think this object and this mix of scales and, and impressions and materials is exactly what somehow characterizes how we work. And for this next part of the lecture, I will talk about four urban figures, I called it today. It's more because of the projects are more recent and have a certain urban um, impact in its own simplicity. More or less, you will see uh, what I mean by, by looking at the projects. So first project, this is a project for Bahrain. It is a, it's called the Pearl Path. 
And on the Pearl Path, there's actually three projects. While well, the Pearl Path itself, there's a, a building for traditional music on the Pearl Path, and there's a, a long bridge being part of that Pearl Path to cross a road. But this is uh, in Bahrain, in Muharraq, uh, the old part of Bahrain. And this is Muharraq, as you can see it on the screen. Muharraq is actually the old Arabic uh, town of Bahrain. So you see the capital is on the left side. This is Muharraq, the actual first settlements where you feel really the Arabic maze of the city as we imagine it. And, uh, and it's, this is where the project happens. And uh, just to give an idea, this is Bahrain, it lays in the Arabic Gulf, uh, next, next to Qatar, actually. And uh, there is uh, the white dot on the top, that's where Muharraq lays. And, and um, so this is actually Muharraq uh, seen from the air, but this is 1930s. And you see how it is a settlement of a quite a beautiful settlement of this kind of uh, houses made out of coral stone, coral stone being digged up from the sea, coral beds. And it's a, it's a community based on the idea of, of fishing, but also on um, actually oil, uh, uh, pearl, pearl trade. This, this whole um, community was very, very important in, uh, internationally at the time for the pearl business. And uh, actually the whole project I will show you, as it's called Pearl Path, is actually relating back to that moment when Bahrain was extremely important in pearling uh, industry. Because afterwards, after this pearling, and this is when the collapse happened in the pearling business, when uh, artificial pearls were made, but then they discovered also oil in uh, Bahrain and in all the other countries around it. And this made it explode in another way. This is a picture from, uh, let's say today, it's looking at it and you see the old form still of the peninsula being extended with land reclamations and this big highway around it. And we were asked to, within this old footprint, to look for a kind of a trail, a pearl path, a path that would lead from the center of the old city towards the coast, where it once had this kind of uh, sticking out landmass towards a fortress which is still there. This is uh, what we, together with the Ministry of Culture, developed. It's a, a, a path going through that whole system of old city, uh, three and a half kilometers long from the top to the sea. And actually, as you can see, it has this very serpentine uh, shape. It is also a kind of a challenge to find your way through this maze. Uh, this is a, a path that the, uh, the, the Department of Culture in Bahrain asked to be part of um, UNESCO World Heritage, and they got it. Uh, and so they wanted to, to, to show it to the visitors. Here you can see it again, this is how we traced. So you have the two shorelines, the old shoreline, the new one, plus, let's say, the, the path that is in there. And the path somehow com consists of a set of real monuments. This is like 12 uh, actual monuments, restored buildings, uh, part of the pearl trade, like the, the captain's house. This is the, the trading of uh, the pearls. Uh, the, the, the mosque, uh, many other, the fishermen's houses, etc. And they're part of a sort of a system, but they're especially also part of the city. The city around it is as valuable because it's really this old Arabic city. And so within that, we, we drew that line and we, we somehow discovered there were a lot of opportunities, that's what we called it. And opportunities you can see here in these blue dots, and opportunities are actually moments where we thought, how can we make actually this path without really drawing a line on the floor? That would be too easy. And so we, we 
started with these images, they are somehow suggesting what could a, a pearl path be. It's, it's, it's moments of, of, let's say, help, we called it. It's almost like a, like a bread crumbles that you find on the road uh, to, to guide yourself through the labyrinth. And at other cases, there's moments of, of opportunity where you have more space, where actually the city has, has been demolished, um, cars were parked there, but actually there we could introduce some moments of, of urbanity, some small uh, s squares, if you want. And this is a final, uh, let's say, concept in which uh, a pearl path, as we thought it should be, three and a half kilometers long, could be actually implemented in the city. It's a set of lamp posts designed very carefully by us, being very specific already. And then sometimes they lead you to these little squares, little squares that fill up an empty area, uh, was a kind of demolished city block of before and somehow reconstitutes the city in its mass but also creates just a small square for a community around it and some shade because it's of course extremely hot in Bahrain in the summer, also in the winter actually. And this gives you a little impression, this is a, a small part of this path. Um, looking at, let's say from the air, you see the, the, the real Arabic uh, maze of the city plus the implants of like small oases that somehow start to grow in that city. And this is a drawing we made also. It's a, actually, we made, a, a, let's say, 22 uh, little squares all along that line. And these 22, they, they, you can consider them as a kind of intimate moments of, of urbanity and of, of social life, of of little squares, as I called them, because they're not really a square. They're more like room-sized, uh, because a, a European square would be, let's say, the co collection of all these squares together. And so somehow by dispersing them through the maze, we made a kind of network of small squares. And this was uh, together with uh, Bas Metz, the landscape designer, we made this. Uh, it's almost as if you put a carpet on the existing pavement where you can plant trees. You can have lights, benches, some water element to drink, and that's, that's about it. But it creates like small microclimates within this city uh, of Muharraq. And here you can see it. We worked a lot on, let's say, how to materialize that. What is this microclimate? First of all, of course, you need the trees. But um, we also worked uh, very hard on how to materialize, let's say, the stones in which we would make it. So these are stones polished, with, which you don't see on the picture, but with the mother of pearl elements within the stone. And so in day, with the sun, but also in night, it, it kind of sh uh, shines in different ways, this uh, stone. And so everything is made out of this stone. So the, the, the square itself, there's tiles, the, the lampposts, the benches, the water element, they're all part of this small universe of, let's say, pearl, mother of pearl stone. And then of course the lights, they, they kind of jump out and they start to lead their own life and guide you towards uh, the next little square. So like this, and you, you understand what I was talking about, about the Arabic maze in this kind of, it's, it's a very uh, beautiful actually uh, maze and there's lots of houses from different times. It's, it's not the houses that are really monuments, but it's rather the maze and it's, its footprint as such that is so beautiful, the labyrinthic quality of it. But just by following the light, you arrive again into another one, and you can see people really use it because there is this microclimate. It's really two, three degrees um, colder or cooler under these trees, and you can sit down and just uh, 
I don't know, do something here, I don't know, he has some <laughs> activity. Um, again, following the lights further to, to, towards the other set of the maze, encountering other small moments of squares. And, and as I said, they somehow create, recreate mass where the city had lost its, its kind of massivity, but just with trees. And, and at some point, and this is, of course, another project I'm going to show you, you encounter this. Uh, and, and, and weirdly enough, the building was first and the path came later, but it seems as if the, the light post jumps into the building with these columns, as you can see in concrete. Um, the light post is actually leading you along this project we made in 2012 in, uh, in Muharraq, in the center. It's for um, traditional mu musicians, um, traditional music of pearl divers. And pearl divers, they were the people who would uh, traditionally go out in the sea and, and, and look for the pearls in the water, dive them. And the whole idea of that was they were two weeks on the sea and all men and they were together and they would make music just to, to uh, kill time, let's say. And this kind of rhythmic music, clapping and, and using as a kind of uh, um, drums the, the, the thoughts they were just uh, traveling with. And this music became so uh, important that people took this pearl diving music back to the coast and started playing the music also in the houses. And the, the Arabic word for house is dar. And um, so we had to make a dar, a kind of a house for pearl dive musicians. And that dar is something as we you saw our first collages of the pearl pot, but in a similar way, we made this as an idea. It had to relate to the old city as a building. It could have three floors. That was the regulations. Like in the area, you have like one, two, three floors. But we somehow decided to relate to the first floor with a kind of tapered shape. And then to make a volume like this, that somehow, not only with its volume, but also with its transparency, uh, plays with the idea of what is intimacy within such an Arabic maze. This is the plan, so it's actually essentially an, an extension of this um, existing house where they already were playing, and we used to, uh, we made a new, let's say, room outside of that system, more as a kind of a performance space, as a, a little theater, if you want in the city, how it somehow relates in its silhouette towards the other buildings, to its neighbor, immediate neighbor, and, and how it also sticks out. And here you start to also see the importance of the materials we use. Uh, this, this is a building fully actually dressed in a chain mill. Uh, it's like a, a big dress made out of metal, um, metal rings that are eternally combinable, so there's no joints, it's like a real tissue. And it somehow has this kind of a, the dust of the city, let's say, is also part in the building, but it doesn't matter because somehow it has this kind of a, let's say, a, a kind of clothing for it. And, and, and as a clothing, as a, as a kind of veil, it can fall down and that's a kind of typical daily moment but at some other moments, it can come up. And that's very important because actually this building has a very important public function within the maze. Uh, at some point, it opens up and this first floor, it's uh, surrounded by these columns, surrounded by a perimeter of uh, utilities, a stair, some a toilet, some, some technical cupboards. But then inside is this beautiful carpet made out of wood for the musicians to play. And this is repeated three times. There is a kind of educational center. There's also some residencies on top for musicians. And so in that sense, it can 
exist as a kind of small theater in the city. And this is how it somehow opens up. But you can also, this is how it relates to the neighbor. But the whole space can open up fully. And I cannot show it. I don't have pictures today with me of the performances. But this is normally full of people in the streets. And then the musicians in the center playing this traditional pearl diving music. Other days it can close totally and it become more of a kind of an intimate meeting space for the, for the same people or other guests that are invited. And within the net or the, the kind of mesh around the building and the space inside, there is this circulation space to go up. This is a view from the, um, the educational space towards the city again with one facade totally opened. And here we're up where the residencies are in, inside this silhouette in the city. So we walk out and we continue. We continue the, the last piece, the trail, the Pearl Path, along these narrow streets in, um, in Muharak. Again, another small square. To finally end up in the last thing we built, which is this uh, pedestrian road crossing because as you have seen in the beginning there has been built this enormous ring road in a reclaimed area of land around the old peninsula totally erasing let's say its old shoreline and adding this enormous uh, five lane ring road so we had to cross that with a very simple bridge let's say pedestrian crossing bridge to be able to reach the old fortress on the downside. This is this last part of the drawing I was just showing to you. It's a bridge of uh, 120 meters that crosses from the old city over the ring road towards the, actually the, the original coastline, the only original coastline left. And so this is a drawing from the sky it's, uh, you can see how it goes from the beginning till the end towards the fortress. And here, uh, in how it is actually materialized, it's a set of feet that hold together one very big white uh, line uh, that is the bridge itself. With an elevator and a stair going up, crossing this entire length of ring road, and finally, having a view already of the modern Bahrain. This, this is Manama, the actual capital we look at in the back, the skyline of Manama. To come to the end, to the actual original coastline of Muharak, looking at the fort, the fortress, the other side, Manama, and this kind of old uh, heritage of, let's say, the pearl uh, path and the pearl business of before. Uh, two projects, <laughs> no, three actually left. I will go quickly. This is, apparently I only have five minutes left. Uh, the beer project in uh, Brussels, um, I will have to go very fast. This is uh, at the canal, a very interesting joint of, let's say, different scales in Brussels. Industrial, uh, very poor neighborhoods, uh, the canal itself, and, and, and port activity. And uh, we were asked, or we actually won a competition to make a, a, a new brew, a brewery, a beer brewery in that, in that site. You will see, um, it, it's kind of a hinge in that site. It's like between uh, these big uh, uh, warehouses, the 19th, uh, 19th century city parts, the harbor for a part. So, but all quite tough and, and quite derelict in its state and a kind of conflictuous uh, area in Brussels. But the building, the new brewery, should somehow try to understand these difficulties and, as a building, turn the energy the other way to, to go from, let's say, a very backside, uh, dirty area into something new, something that is uh, a new beginning of the site. And this is what the has been built. This is actually construction picture 
uh, it was almost finished, the building. So you can see there's this backside here, which is like building materials at the harbor scale. There's the other side with the warehouses. And then there's the neighborhoods, which are quite tough and, and poor, but as a kind of new activity in, implemented and contemporary activity of uh, beer brewing, we, we somehow realized that you could make that hinge just with a building. And the stripes of colors, in, in case you were wondering, actually the beer brand, Brussels Beer Project, has always a diagonal different colored stripe on, on the bottle uh, to show its different uh, types of beer. So you have always a different color. And so we decided to make almost like a flag, which is the roof which you are under, you will see this now. So a flag out of the different colors of, of the beers they produce. And a space, and these were first collages we made that would somehow shelter this activity, but at the same time, with its roof and with its content, be part of the city with a very direct industrial infill, which is the brewing process. Till even you go on top in this building and there's even public moments, a small bar, uh, a bar that is part of the city overlooking the landscape because this is the section of the building it's actually one big shed roof that has positioning for these big big uh, brewing vats and then underneath more like the typical other processes of canning and putting uh, beers in the in the bottles uh, or in the cans and 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 so on ground floor with uh, four openings one towards the north which is the little square in front where you see a kind of vitrine of the production. On the east, you get the entrance. In the west, you have actually, uh, south, you have the full garden, uh, a beer garden, a real beer garden where people come actually today, tomorrow, uh, all the summer days, it's full. And then the, in the west part, there is the, there's the delivery, the logistics. So this is a, a plan on top because we made kind of tables in this big figure and you notice that the figure is this kind of parallelogram which is shifted from the roof that's also a very important thing to to understand how it sits in the side uh, from the water in the big openings you can already see them uh, there is of course there's uh, the front you could say which is not really the front it's just a kind of vitrine of the project, the étalage. You see the big, big vats, almost like cylinders, popping out from under the roof. Below, there's the big window. On the side, there's this side view where the roof sticks out because of the shape of the building. Towards the back, and this is the beer garden. You see here glimpses of even some industrial elements just parked under this overhanging uh, roof. And then inside, in this kind of narrow spaces between what we call tables and, and, and box, you can have spaces like stairs, other tables with brewing machines, brewing, brewing. It's a whole process with labs and so on. We designed all of this together with the, with the brewery, of course. But you see also how this content, it's super full under this very, let's say, colorful roof is actually the only real, uh, uh, let's say, architecture of this building. The rest is pragmatic, etc. And And in that kind of simplicity, it, it's kind of activating the site in its immediacy. The logistical side, logistics. And here you see, by the way, also how the neighborhood is somehow already transforming towards how the building is. Two more minutes <laughs> for two projects. Okay, very fast. This is a um, um, reconversion of an office building in Kortrijk in Belgium, where we basically, uh, I'll skip the context, but this building was there, 60s, very bad uh, building, uh, but of the Flemish government. And they wanted to make an example for a new 
um, sustainable building. And we actually reused the old structure, as you can see on top, that's the top building, by putting a new building, like a new coat, you could say, around the old structure. The old structure is quite beautiful. So to, to redefine this as a new silhouette, almost what's contemporary architecture, it's also the reuse of the old one. Positioning in the site, but just to re-establish this, this is the stripped building in concrete, and by building a new building around it with thick columns that are actually uh, air shafts, air shafts that bring in the air into the building because the, the height of the structure was too low to, to put it under the ceiling. So we used the vertical shafts here to bring the air inside. This is a sectional detail where you see how this building really stands next to the old one. Also with different orientations, with different depths towards the sun, to be able to, let's say, make a totally passive and uh, zero energy building out of this old structure. And today it's been used very efficiently by, by, again, by the Flemish government for many services they have. But here you also see from the inside the, the kind of how, how old and new work together. The, the old column, the old roof, uh, ceiling, and the new column standing outside with actually the, the, the grills for ventilation. On the corner, the same story. And even outside these terraces, they are accessible. You can go outside through the window and be in the city uh, surrounded by this new kind of code like building. This is the entrance, by the way. Okay, and now the super speed version of a very big project. We're actually um, finishing uh, this year or next year. It's uh, the Radio Television Suisse. It's the French speaking headquarters for the radio and television broadcasting um, headquarters in, in Switzerland, in Lausanne. Uh, and this is where it is. It's actually part of a bigger campus. You might know this building on the left side, which is the Rolex Learning Center uh, by uh, Sejima uh, or Sana. And uh, on the, well, we are actually just neighbors of it. And so it's, it's a building in which, just because of its sheer size, urbanity is absorbed entirely in it, and it plays with a sort of a kind of almost an urban plan within an enormous campus that is around it. So it will be shared by students, by people who work there, by visitors, of course. It's a very public building, but at the same time, it's also extremely uh, physical, a physical entity towards what is media and what is production of media today, uh, which is super ephemeral. And the ground floor plan is a kind of collapse of logistics with the public. And you see already four of these big volumes because this is the first floor at eight meters height plan. It's a plan of 150 meters by 100 meters, more or less, in this strange ear shape. And it's, it's, in itself, it's already sort of an urbanity. It's blocks of buildings together, held together with structure uh, of, of activity, of creation, of, of making of media. It's a kind of contemporary, you could say, factory or a house um, it's all of that together uh, for the capacity of, let's say, 1,500 uh, people that have to work daily together. And that happens all in this one layer, suspended above the campus at 8 meter height and held up by four uh, volumes. It's, it's almost like a, a kind of software package. And then there's the hardware that can happen in, in the bigger boxes. First collages that we made during the competition that show that capacity and the inside of that space. And now I'll just show this is the model we wanted seven years ago with the hardware, big studios, and, and, and the software. Creation of media is like a big, big field where everybody works together. 
and of course the structural system. And this is uh, today, just took some building side pictures to show you today uh, how it is. And we're actually almost finishing with the roof now, finishing this amazing space that is created where these thousands of people or at least 1,000 will work together creating media. This is uh, seven and a half meter high, if you want to know. And then there's the bigger volumes again, holding hardware, studios, things, circulation also, where you can come down in the campus where logistics and public and visitors, they will just be coexisting. And it's the last picture of my lecture. It's almost there, the building. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. It's really incredible how you constructed this narrative from the very simple intervention which defined the city passes to the very complex building. And I would like um, to open the floor for the questions. Тож, um, друзі, uh, я всіх вас запрошую задати... Now I want to open it up to the audience. Friends, we have enough two very brief questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand. I can see a raised hand there. I was first. Uh, thank you. It's incredible and also for Ukrainian context to know that you can do the architecture with a capital A, with a, as an art form, but with quite simple means sometimes. And uh, of course, looking from the projects from different regions uh, and different countries, but uh, what is maybe similar is the materiality. So in many of your works, it's uh, metal, okay. concrete, and uh, this opaque uh, and sometimes transparent elements. Um, so I'm just wondering what uh, materials in terms of architecture and local, local sources of materials place in your architecture. Is it important or is it um, somehow like uh, architecture is reflection of international, uh, global, um, economy in terms of uh, construction materials? Um, I think a sentence we use often is uh, economy of means, uh, which, uh, well, translates how, exactly how, what it means in the sense that there is an economy and there is the means and towards it. And this is really a, a way of working, how we work in the office. But it's, it's also at the same time, um, so, so there's, let's say, a project with a quite high ambition, but then there's the reality of a budget. And I guess we always, or at least try to manage to never lower that ambition, uh, like the Switzerland project, it's kind of ambitious in its first step by raising up the entire floor of uh, production, a floor of 120 by uh, 100 meter, and, and to do that, in a kind of um, in a land as Switzerland, where building costs are extremely high, but but we we managed working together with with engineers uh, thinking about structure, about materials, also of course to to get this building built in a kind of very reasonable budget. Um, and and I use now the big example of Switzerland, but I, I could apply this to, to the, the beer brewing project uh, you, you, were, you saw as well, because there it, it was really, the budget was nothing. We get uh, the budget of a industrial shed basically to, to build um, a fully working brewer, brewery. And, and of course you can wonder where's architecture? Uh, where do you find, as you call it, the architecture with a capital A? It's, it's rather in these intentions of a project, uh, like the roof with the colors, it's, it's, it's how you detail it. We detailed it with very direct industrial facades, 
but it's, it's in all these intentions, you should still find a project survive. And so I would say there's not a real um, dogma around how we use materials. It's rather how we think materials uh, and how you can apply them ultimately to become uh, performative in their way to, to, to bring the argument even further. It's, the, the economy of means is rather than and it's a limit, it's, a, it's maybe a, more of a freedom to us. Thank you. Um, I have for one more question. Another question, yes, I can see one more. Uh, question? Is relevant Ukrainian recovery after war? In your opinion, what Ukraine opt is it fast solutions to build um, residential for people that have lost uh, their homes in previous presentations? So the question um, in the think like then, what should we slide? implement first like the fast solutions for the urgent problems of housing people who lost their homes <laughs> and other urgent problems or should we steadily work on the development of um, architectural culture for everyone mm -hmm. like long-term solutions well I think uh, we should not choose between uh, both uh, options I, I they should be parallelly developed in a sense that I was also, as all of you, very impressed by uh, the lecture of uh, Shigeru Ban that can deliver very urgent need uh, shelter for, for, let's say, displaced uh, groups of people. That's, that's crucial to understand that need, but I guess for us as architects, it's also a moment to reflect in a, a, a kind of a more, let's say, um, far away future uh, or, or long-term future to, to reflect what is uh, rebuilding Ukraine, what, how can you think that, how do you use, let's say, a simple means to, to create new qualities. Uh, and that's I, f what we say often, also when we're teaching, is um, actually what many people see as a problem that is the slowness of architecture once you see it as a quality and you embrace that as a as an actual positive thing uh, a lot can happen and i think that's that's a very important thing to to not be um only thinking of tomorrow but even uh years ahead and and i guess it's a profession of architects and urbanists in general, but so I would say you need the parallel tracks, both together. Yeah, thank you very much, David. Um, warm applause again for our speaker, David Van Severen. Thank you. Thank you.